My name is John Baker. I'm one of the faculty members here in the art and design department. And uh, I'm also, I also serve as the gallery director, so I want to welcome all of you to the fall season uh, at the Searville Gallery. Um, in, let's see, on November 9, we're going to have uh, Sergio Gomez, who is a Chicago gallerist and artist, come talk for uh, Art Visit Day. Uh, a week from tonight, we're going to have Gabe Marino, who uh, is a recent graduate of uh, University of Chicago, uh, where he worked with um, Jessica Stockholder and Theaster Gates. If you know those two artists, they're um, big, big names. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, before tonight's artists, uh, just a word about the Searville Gallery. Um, Calvin Searville was, which you may not know, was one of the founding uh, faculty members, one of four, here at Trinity in 1959. Uh, he is a philosopher who has written extensively in aesthetics, and there just isn't a person alive who is a, a deeper friend of artists than Cal Searville, both in terms of his defense of the discourse uh, as well as his contributions um, to it aesthetically. So tonight, uh, we're welcoming two of our faculty members, um, Ryan Thompson, who's the chair of the department, and Su Shin, who uh, teaches, um, has taught a number of things, and right now teaching uh, printmaking. Um, Su Shin uh, was born in Seoul, uh, got her BFA and MFA in Seoul, and uh, then came here to the United States and got an additional MFA at the, from the School of the Art Institute. She's shown widely from uh, Berlin to Seoul and uh, New York and Chicago and a whole lot of points in between. Um, more recently, she's been doing residencies. Uh, the McDowell Colony at, uh, um, at the Vermont Studio, is that right? Um, I mean, the McDowell uh, Colony, colony uh, the, Vermont, sure, yeah. the Vermont Studio Center, an artist residency program this summer at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, for those of you who know Jessica Tam, it's uh, in the same little town, uh, North Adams, uh, in a major United States museum. And in uh, next summer, she will be at uh, the John Michael Kohler Art Center. So, um, a, a really uh, productive, uh, interesting career so far. <clears throat> um, and we also have uh, Ryan Thompson. Uh, <clears throat> Ryan studied, uh, got his BFA at Calvin College, uh, just up the road, and uh, his MFA at um, uh, Champaign-Urbana, the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Uh, as you all know, he's shown widely uh, uh, Berlin, the last, Berlin, right, or Munich? Munich. Um, with uh, some of the work from uh, 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 Bad Luck Hot Rocks, uh, in the last two years, he's had nine exhibitions across the country, including um, uh, work at the University of New Mexico, uh, where he uh, gave a talk just like this. <clears throat> um, so, like uh, the gallery, uh, the, the gallery continues this tradition of showing really significant artists from around the region as well as uh, of farther flung parts. Um, so, time to welcome Su Shin. <clears throat> Um, before I start, I'd like to thank you guys to um, come here. I didn't know that it's going to be this big of crowd. Yeah, it's a little overwhelming, but okay. So today I'm going to talk about um, yeah the general idea uh, around my practice. Um, but why I'm doing it, I'm going to just um, show some of my recent work. Um, also, I'm not going to um, explain every single pieces and all the details of um, all the pieces, um, because for me, um, the viewer's experience and um, the viewer's um, interpretation of the work in the space with the work is really important. So I don't really want to just like give out all the like 
um, information because I think that it's just kind of like almost then it just like becomes like oh did I read it right or not so yeah it's just like totally up to you but I'm gonna just um, talk about the general idea of my practice okay So um, this is a picture of my um, previous studio. I recently moved to my studio to um, Garfield Park in Chicago. But I, uh, while I'm talking, I thought that it would be nice for you guys to just like, look at something. So yeah. <laughs> OK. So um, <clears throat> what, is the, what is the common ground in our belief systems? This has been my. Um, this has been the core question um, regarding my practice for a long time. We often experience to have believe in de um, in the definite truth, but then the next thing that we are re we realize is that the truth is no longer valid. The only apparent truth sometimes seems to be the uncertain and the provisional nature of the truth. We learn and navigate our path through the new beliefs, and often we have to grasp at reality and move forward through the debris, our own darkness, where we cannot really foresee. Um, I understand that questioning what we believe makes us experience discomfort, discomfort and fear. However, by acknowledging the latent uncertainty in our belief system, we can open the non-binary space where the constructive conversation and the new possibility can be discussed. Um, With my practice, I address, the, uh, I address this mental space of uncertainty and the vulnerability and the struggle in the search for the truth. To portray this psychological experience, I use bodily gesture as the metaphor. Body is the agency of the experiences and it is inseparable from our psychology. My work is presented as personal architecture, providing space for a body, implying certain body gestures or bodily attempts without any direct reference to a body. <clears throat> this is because the body that is suggested in my work is my um, physical body and the, um, and the audience's body in the space. Um, so in a way, the body is suggested as absence while the work blurs the boundary between object and space. <clears throat> um, to create the keen relationship to the body, I make specific choices regarding the scale and the form. Most of most of times the measurements are coming from my body, such as um, the height of my body, the width of my shoulders, um, the width of my feet or hand, the length of my legs, or the, um, or the dimensions of the space where my body can tightly fit in. Um, <clears throat> Instead of adding much color in my work, I use materials' original color to reveal, um, to reveal their uh, materiality. I believe that different materials carry their own universal language that can be perceived instantly when being encounter encountered by a body. In my work, the materials own properties such as weight, rigidity, flexibility, warmth, Coldness are the vocabularies to um, delineate certain <coughs> conditions for the body. The alluded, ge the alluded gestures reflect the moment of not being able to see any further, staring into darkness or being seen by the darkness, listening to the silence, 
balancing on the ground and other um, some other physical gestures that um, hold certain amount of tension. Um, the work often has the aspect of the uh, of the abrupt change in their physical state based upon the potential bodily interaction. This reflects the transient state of the reality where the body resides in. Um, some of my pieces have a reflective surface. This is to include the viewer's body within the work while um, encouraging them to be more aware of their own body um, around, the, around the work. Even though my work addresses the space for a body, the form is very reductive. This is, again, to have the viewer more attentive to their own body within the present moment and the space. Um, since my work addresses the viewer's body while guiding them into the potential bodily gesture, I think um, since my work addresses the viewer's body while guiding them into the potential bodily gesture, I think that just um, suggesting the condition for the body is enough instead of um, adding what it feels like. Um, so it's almost like I'm suggesting the frame for the viewers to experience the subject matter. Um, actually, when I was in grad school, I made like very different work, but I was still dealing with the same um, subject matter, but the work was just like, really chaotic. And I think that, um, yeah, but I mean, what I was going for that back then was I was just trying to, um, create object that almost like confronts the viewer in a very like bodily um, manner. But um, I found that uh, a lot of people were responding to um, the construction of the work or the chaotic nature of the work, but um, I just felt that um, the subject wasn't really delivered clearly because I mean um, I think that people were responding more to the the form itself because it was very uh, overwhelming. So through time uh, I graduate I graduated um, 2011 and then through that time I think that uh, my work has been continuously like reduced. I mean like form wise and also color wise. Um, some people ask me about the possibility for my work to be interactive since it suggests the viewer's body and a uh, certain gesture, and the answer is no. <laughs> they are going to break my work for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the practical level, the, um, the work will not hold the weight of the human body. Um, I mean, the way it's constructed, I just I want the work to look like very light. And um, yeah, I mean, so basically that um, kind of fragile state, I mean, so yeah, the fragile state is also important. So it's not really like practically, like it's, yeah, on the practical level, it's not interactive at all. Um, and then, also, um, the um, mechanic of it, it's um, kind of paradoxical. 
so it's just like it's almost like um, basically like the good example can be it's almost like a pair of glasses that's gonna block your vision so or just like something that you can wear but it's gonna turn into ashes as soon as you just put it on or something I mean like so that's just like that um, paradox is always in my work I mean so it's not um, made <laughs> to function in certain way even though they look very um, utilitarian. So um, I'm playing with that uh, ambiguous tension between um, inviting the body but yet pushing the body away to create the in-between um, this like in between object which is not completely physical yet somewhat psychological. Um, yeah, so because of this, I don't want um, this object to be performed with. Um, also the tension, um, also that, um, that tension between the invitation and the rejection as the layer of the, um, uh, as the layer of the idea um, potential to the work. I mean, um, I think that one, if it's, a, um, if it's going to be experienced like physically, then there's the starting point and they're gonna be the end. I mean, also the work is not going to give out any like end result regarding the per, I mean, um, interaction, but um, yeah, I think that um, when it's, um, when it's not experienced, then it's gonna be always um, unknown and it's going to be always on I mean on in concluded I mean um, which is the major aspect of the uncertainty that I'm talking about so for me like the object looking very like oh like it kind of it looks like it has some function and there's handle it just like I'm supposed to just uh, hold on to it or something but the fact that it's not, I think that it creates this, like, it always exists in this um, potential uh, realm. So it's, um, yeah, so in a way, um, the idea, I mean, so through that, um, I'm just like thinking about the process of searching, searching the truth. Um, because it's just like in your head, I mean, it's just like always that like your decision, it's just like something that you project. So I'm kind of like addressing that through that. Like it's not, it's just like something that you imagine or you see around this like um, actual matter. So for me, almost, I mean like creating this almost like ghost around my work is the way to just um, tap into that idea. Um, and then So, I mean, that's, I think that it's too short, but I think that that's just like, um, that I prepare for the talk. And um, I actually wanted to just um, let you guys know that you can just ask me a question while I was talking, but I forgot, so I guess nobody, <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, if you guys have any question, I mean, should I just take the question now or should I do it after you? Let's, let's do it together. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you so much.
So I just want to start really quick with some of my kind of foundational questions. Um, if you were here four years ago for this talk, these are going to be similar or the same. And there might be a couple projects that I talked about then. Uh, most of you were not, so it will not be review. Um, I operate under a, a framework called the Department of Natural History, which is just me. Um, but it sounds more interesting than, than just me, right, than ryanthompson.com. So um, the Department of Natural History, there's a lot of Ryan Thompsons in the world too. So um, the Department of Natural History is a way of branding my studio practice and organizing my own thoughts as well and organizing my thoughts for others to understand like what it is that I'm interested in, what it is that I do. It actually came from a graduate school advisor, professor, who said I make work that looks like a natural history museum. And I thought, aha, that's true. I didn't realize that about myself. Um, and so this kind of spun out of there. Um, so my, my kind of primary questions for myself and for my studio practice are, how can I or we better understand our place within the history of the universe? Uh, what role do images and objects, I would say, not just lens-based images, play in how we perceive and understand the natural world? And how might I make work that encourages or engenders transformational thinking? <clears throat> so those are some of the big picture questions. I won't really return to those in too much detail, but you can keep them in mind as I move through just a couple projects. I'm going to look at a couple projects that are quite a bit older, 2009, 8, 7, something like that, and then kind of jump forward um, a decade. Um, so the Department of Natural History is almost a decade old. Um, so within that practice of the Department of Natural History, I want to talk about three, another three, right? Another good sermon here. Um, three parts of that um, time perception, and paradox. Thanks, Sue. Paradox again. Um, as a way of getting into the work that's in the gallery right now. Um, but first, I, I asked Baker the other day what I should talk about. And you know, I was going to give an artist talk in a couple days, and I needed to prepare for it. And I said, Baker, what, you know, what, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to talk about? And he said, anybody know? Art history. So here's some art history, a little bit of contemporary history. This is not my work. This is uh, a, freeze a frame from a film that you might recognize by Alfred Hitchcock, yeah, Psycho. So this is a piece called 24 Hour Psycho by Douglas Gordon. Um, and I actually need some notes here. Okay, so 1993, um, what Douglas Gordon did with Hitchcock's Psycho is he slowed it down to last 24 hours, hence the title, 24 Hour Psycho, as a way of recontextualizing our understanding of time and as a way of kind of analyzing the seminal piece of, of film history. Um, there's a lot of famous cuts and shots in this film, and so by slowing it down and make eaching, making each frame last half of a second, rather than 1 24th of a second, it radically kind of alters your perception of the film, and you might spend a few minutes in the gallery watching it, in the museum watching it, and then you leave and you're going about your business and you're kind of wondering to yourself, what part of the film you're now experiencing outside of the gallery, right? Outside of the space and time of the theater. Um, so you're sort of recalibrating um, that experience and trying to think about time in some new ways. And Gordon talked about this as a time ready-made, and he did a number of pieces like this. Uh, and it was a precursor to um, uh, this piece that I made um, called Tree Fell Sight where I filmed a tree being felled, a tree being cut down by a tree service in Urbana, where I was in school, Urbana, Illinois. Um, and it took the tree company, the tree service, about three hours to cut this tree down. After I cut out all the kind of intermission or interstitial periods, I was just concentrating on the person in the bucket truck with the chainsaw that when I re-edited that video back together, it's about three hours long. And so what I did is I took that three hour video and stretched it out to last the lifespan of the tree. So now we have a three hour tree fell happening um, for 80 years. I estimated that the tree was 80 years old using you know, dendro 
chronology, counting the tree rings. And so here's a, a video that started in 2007 and will last until 2087. Over the course of that 80 years, the tree is getting cut down once again. As a way of um, thinking about our actions and recontextualizing time, what is time to a tree? How do we understand time relative to trees or tree time, relative to human time, relative to te technological time? A uh, big theme is for me is sort of thinking about these overlapping time scales, technological time, tree time, rock time, geologic time, cosmic time, human time, and trying to better understand kind of where we fit in those time frames as a way of literally slowing down time and getting us to think a little more conscientiously about the time that we have on Earth. Um, so the video will play through once. Technically, it's a bunch of still images that last for many, many minutes, over an hour each. So to call it a video is probably a little bit of a stretch, um, but it does present a series of images chronologically um, through the use of a little bit of PHP script that's connected to a web website. And um, you can, um, not right now, it's actually not functioning right now, but you could for a, a time kind of check in on it and kind of see where the tree was at relative to your experience of, of, that, of, of the tree. So it was accompanied by this full-scale, one-to-one scale photograph of the stump in, in, this, in the front yard of the folks who own this tree. Um, and then I got interested in these rocks that I was seeing in the cornfields of Urbana, which is a very flat, very rural place to attend grad school for art specifically. Um, and these giant rocks called glacial erratics were dumped um, wherever, really, uh, during the last ice age, 50,000 years ago or so, and then we're sort of left to deal with them. So I started getting interested in geologic time as this way of kind of stepping back and saying, okay, what if I experience 80 years of a tree? Now what if I experience 50,000 years, right? Thinking about this glacier moving this rock great distances from Canada down to the you know cornfields of Illinois. Um, what then? How do I better understand my, my place in that in that time frame? Um, I it's I, I'm still working on it. I don't know. <laughs> Trying to understand a thousand years is difficult, let alone you know thousands and thousands or millions of years. So, um, at the time in 2008, we were going through a technological transition in which people were hurriedly moving from CRT cathode ray tele tube televisions to um, flat screen televisions because in July of 2009, the switch got flipped on analog signal and so no one could receive an analog television signal anymore and now we're all on digital signal um, for over the air television. And so people were either getting these little converter boxes um, to make their cathode ray tube television work to, make, to convert the digital signal to analog so the TV could project the image. Um, but more often than not, saying, why should I spend 20 or $40 on this box when I can go and get a flat screen television, which is the future, LCD, LED, right? Um, so this was happening a lot and still is happening. Thrift stores don't take these things anymore for the most part because there's just too many of them. Um, but what do they look like to you? They look a little bit like boulders, right? They look like some kind of erratic that someone is kind of casting off, right, off their front porch or down their front steps onto the street, quite literally in some cases. And so I was interested in kind of connecting this technological transition that felt very urgent, immediate, like it had to happen. We had to get these new televisions quickly or we wouldn't be able to watch television. Um, so there was this kind of 12 months, six months, maybe even more compressed for some people transition that felt very imminent and very urgent. Um, and then you think about this rock sitting on the corner of someone's cornfield that they don't know what to do with that's been sitting there for 50,000 years and it kind of makes you feel a little bit silly um, or kind of make, you know, makes you kind of question the urgencies of life. Um, and so I created these animations, um, these stereoscopic GIFs or video pieces that just take two frames, uh, two photographs from slightly different perspectives that recreate a stereoscopic image uh, like uh, the parlor entertainment from the late 19th century where you have a little viewer and you move this card and the images combine in your visual cortex and it looks three-dimensional. This is just the digital version of that. And it, it is kind of goofy and kind of wonky as some people describe it. 
uh, makes you laugh a little bit, makes you feel a little maybe, I don't know, uneasy at times in the stomach. And uh, it gives it a kind of physicality, and then it relates very well to the physicality of of the televisions on which they're displayed. So there's this very direct kind of correlation between the two where you're wrestling with these two very different kinds of erratics that exist in public space. Uh, and I made a map for them, sort of kind of showing like these hypothetical trajectories for these erratics. This was in um, Geneva, Switzerland. And I made a video, there comes some more art history, bigger. Um, where I took a rock from a stream in New York State that I'm calling a glacial erratic, and I moved it, kicked it, pushed it, rolled it into my car, into a crate, in, onto an airplane, and into a gallery. Um, and as a way of thinking about the movement of people and places and things and objects in the world, right? Artwork has to be moved around the world because it gets bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold, and so it gets collected and moved, and it, it's kind of this physical matter, right? And it was responding to that idea of just the moving of things around the globe and thinking about kind of like global shipping lanes and things like that, but also responding to this piece by an artist named Francis Elise. Um, this is a piece called The Paradox of Praxis, with the subtitle, Sometimes Making Something Leads to Nothing. And he's pushing a large cube of ice through the streets of Mexico City in 1997, thinking about what it means to make creative work or make work in general um, in the current age and how sometimes it feels maybe like you're just pushing a block of ice that's slowly melting through the streets until you're left with nothing at all. It turns into this tiny little puddle at the end of the video um, and some kids just are there talking to him about it. And so also as a video artist, chiefly as a video artist, Francis Elise is also thinking about like the dematerialeality of digital artwork and, and video work, which doesn't have often a kind of physical pre presence outside of maybe a DVD at the time or a, a, a string of digits you know, on a flash drive these days. And so he's thinking about that idea, right? Like here's what I'm left with is nothing ultimately. Um, and so my piece is this kind of comic rejoinder to that, like the collector that bought this piece has to actually deal with this 30 pound boulder rock thing in a crate and the video piece as well. So I'm kind of tagging like this dematerialized video piece with this, with this weight as a way of saying, no, we do have, we do live embodied experiences and we do have to deal with things in our, in our lives, um, things that break and things that require energy to move around the world. So it was a way of wrestling a little bit with this exhibition that was on another continent um, that I had not, you know, with collectors and gallerists that I had no experience of and little contact with um, before, of course, being there. Okay, so jumping a few years ahead, um, this exhibition currently features a bunch of images, rubbings, wax rubbings on uh, a kaba paper, which is kind of a rice type paper. Um, and they they come from sundials, uh, sundials being one of the oldest ways of telling time along with water clocks and um, sand clocks. Uh, there's sundials that go all the way, am I having, am I doing okay? You can hear me. There's uh, sundials that go all the way back to 1500 BC with the Egyptians. Um, and so it's a very old way of telling time and it, is an interesting way of keeping track of time for a couple reasons. I think it's both more precise because it's geographically located or cosmically located, right? It, it pays no mind to date lines or time zones um, or daylight savings time, right? It's very sort of, uh, it's located based on the sun, right? And this sort of cosmic uh, circling of planets, which is really interesting, um, that it kind of defies some modern conventions of timekeeping. Um, but it's also terribly imprecise compared to modern timekeeping, right? It doesn't really give us a sense of like what time of day it is, apart from like it's between two o'clock and three o'clock, or it's night because I can't read it at all, or there's no sun. Um, so it's a really fascinating way of telling time, and it's become a little bit of like a garden trinket, I think, for most people, like this kind of oddity of a time past, and it has this nostalgic or romantic connection for a lot of people, because of course we you know, have very precise timepieces in our pockets. Um, 
So that's an interesting paradox in, in, that it's kind of more and less accurate than what we're familiar with. Um, this comes from the Nashatoa Theological Seminary in Nashatoa, Wisconsin. Um, they've got this sundial kind of tucked away behind one of their buildings that they have some ritual performance around related to graduate, related to um, something with graduation. Um, and it says uh, here embedded in the top, it says the morning cometh and also the night. Whoa. Um, a lot of sundials have mottos, and they are paradoxical, and they have double meanings, and they're very poetic, and they're both extremely cliched at times and extremely heavy at times. This one falls for me a little bit on the heavier side of things, right? The morning cometh, which is very hopeful, and also the night. They deal with... Um, time broadly speaking but they also deal with themselves as objects that keep track of time and so um, this says um, I don't know Latin but sinsule ni nihil uh, without the sun nothing which is true in a few ways right um, without the sun we would have no life and so that's pretty heavy that's uh, that weighs on my on my shoulders and I like to think about those kind of interactions, right, between the sun and the earth and life. Um, but it also means that without the sun, you can't tell time on a sundial, which is uh, this kind of, you know, joke, basically, right, that the people who made the sundial were thinking about it as an object that we're, that we're dealing with, uh, but also time in this very kind of deep, this deep time. Um, this one was in Urbana, Illinois, on the president's lawn uh, for the UIUC. Um, it says a few things on it. It says, amidst ye flowers, I tell ye hours. This is from 1909, so the language is a little bit different and the spellings are a little bit different. Um, I don't know that there's a double meaning there. I think it's mostly referring to the sundial itself, right? This is like, would go in a flower garden, amidst ye flowers, I tell ye hours. But I like that it's in the first person. It's an object that's kind of speaking to you, right? This is like object-oriented ontology for uh, the philosophers um, before that was a thing. And uh, I like thinking about objects having agency or having a, a voice in this way, um, things having a voice. So having propensities or proclivities or trajectories. Um, it also has, unless you can think of another double meaning here. Talk to me later. Make the passing shadow serve thy will. Again, it took me a while to figure out that this was also about the sundial because I, I really liked this kind of heavy meaning at first, right? Like, let's bend the world to our will. Like, it's kind of a scary concept, um, but it's, I don't know. Uh, yeah, a very magnetic concept, right? Like taking power or using using things for your, for your will, um, like the shadow. But it's also just about using the sundial. Um, the Grim Reaper fe features prominently on many sun sundials. Take tent, O time, ere time be tent. I'm going to let that one just sit for a while. Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be. This comes from a Robert Browning poem from 1864 about a 12th century scholar. Oh, that one got in twice, didn't it? I've got some repetition. Um, and then I've got some large Roman numerals here that come from a, a piece in Waukesha, Wisconsin, a little veterans park area where someone was cutting down a tree the day I was there. And you can see sort of how imprecise this is, right? The, the, the stylus um, or the style of the, the nonum, nomen, um, which is the perpendicular part of the sundial, is sort of pointing to one o'clock-ish. Uh, it was 1.30, I think, when I took this photo. So it's a fairly imprecise way of keeping time, especially on this large scale. Um, but I like these Roman numerals for the way that they, uh, their, their impact and the way that they sort of also portend a different way of thinking about numbers and time, and um, or portray, rather. 
And in the gallery, you'll see um, sort of how they've been used, and hopefully they'll spark some ideas in terms of the design of the exhibition itself. So um, I don't have too much more to say about this specific project. I'm happy to answer questions, um, but it's very new, and so I'm still figuring it out a little bit. Um, thank you. Yeah. So you'll see it in a minute. I don't want to ruin it, but uh, maybe you've already looked at the exhibition. But I thought it would be interesting if we could talk also just about a two-person exhibition and kind of pulling, thinking about the, the, the similarities and differences between our work and why perhaps we were interested in having an exhibition together, um, which we started talking about a year and a half ago or more. Um, and also just a little bit about the display of the exhibition. but. Before that, we could, you know, entertain questions, too, yeah. If there are any. Yeah, there you go. For the Roman numerals and the um, sayings, was that a rubbing, or what materials did you use to make those? They're all just a wax block rubbed on the, uh, straight on the paper, which was overlaid on either the pedestals or the sundials themselves or the ground is the case of the Roman numerals. Yeah, there was like the, these kind of brass inset letters in concrete for that one. So they're all just straight rubbings and probably did like a few dozen at each location and then picked the best one or two. Yeah, yeah. Deborah. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly how many sheets of paper I went through, but a good collection. Yeah. In order to get some you know, there's this kind of funny process of like wanting to make them fairly straightforward as like in indexes or records or documents of the place or of the object and not really wanting to editorialize too much but also wanting to acknowledge that um, it feels very different to kind of make a make something that has a kind of circular form or this kind of shadow cloud form as it does to just do the text, right? So there's a lot of experimentation in the, along the way of thinking about how much coverage and how contrasty and how much media and how to, you know, kind of apply it such that I get not just an index, but also something that has a little bit of direction and communicates in a slightly different way, in, in a way that I wanted to communicate. Yeah. Michael. The uh, Amidst Ye Flowers piece, that was 1909. Around the yeah. So one of the things that's interesting is that with the sun, that interested me at any rate, is that with the sun dials, they are trying to be more antique than they actually are. Mm -hmm. Because this is the same time in 1909 as the beginning of T.S. Eliot's very modernist poems. Yes. So that in terms of the language, you'd have to go back to the 16th century to get that. Yeah. To get that. Okay. Uh, I don't recognize it. You know, Karen doesn't recognize it either. <laughs> um, it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if, if it, it had other reference. If yeah. it has a reference within it, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't, it's kind of the same thing as um, when print comes around. People are still trying to make books look as if they were handwritten. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Roman numerals. Playing with the letters and also yeah, just the changing kind of the, the letters around. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know how that works in terms of your thinking about geological time or whatever. I guess a question I would have for both of you is uh, you, Su Shin, are talking about sometimes about the body, but also about psychology. That's right. right? But it, if I think about the body and about position, positionality and the space surrounding it, and, and also, if I think about the work that you're doing, Ryan, you're talking about geological time, but I'm kind of wondering, where's the social here? Because it seems to me the social could be right there, but neither of you is talking so much about the social just yet. Would that make it, is that another access to your work, or is that another? Mm, I haven't really like thought about like that, but I think that um, I think that it just kind of like 
the psychological body that I'm talking about is just like like the first like frame that's what can be like social, but I'm just kind of like yeah, I guess I'm not talking about the very like personal space, but I think that I mean I understand the body has like such like political issues around it, but I think that I'm kind of talking about the common aspect within the body. So in a way, I think that it's kind of addressing the social issues in a way. I mean, like the common like aspect within it. So I mean, but I'm not like, yeah, you're right, and I'm not. It, what it feels to me like it very easily could be social or anthropological. Yeah. But when you're describing it, you're you're not talking about it that uh -huh. way. And I wondered I wondered if you'd be open to that. Yeah, I mean like once it feels right, I'll probably yeah. I, I could put yeah, I could probably like um, for you I'm thinking more of the anthropological. Sure. So these projects are not a great example of the work that is more social, right? Like I think about the Battle of Rocks project as being very anthropological and social and engaged in conversations about shared experience and things like that. But um, could you, I don't, like, uh, I'm curious about this, if you've got more specifics in terms of like what you mean by social, yeah. It, it might be easier for me with the body because our body okay. is, is the way we interact with the world around us mm -hmm. and how we think about our bodies and how our bodies get positioned, all that sort of thing. But with yours, Ryan, I'm thinking it makes a difference how a sundial enters the world and where it's placed and what it does in relationship to that placement. Mm -hmm. right? And why is it that we want to have these on the one hand, elemental, on the other hand, antique kinds of things surround. And what do they do to the areas that surround them? Why would they be in a president's house or in a flower garden? Yeah. And, and do they act yeah. against that in some way? In mm -hmm. some ways, are they not corrosive exactly, but they also provide a critique of that very place where they've been sent. Mm -hmm. I, this would that be one way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speak. No, I'm interested in those questions. I, I don't think I've, I think my interest in them is very different right now, but I think those are interesting questions for sure. And I have some kind of maybe cynical responses to that more right now, more than like positive, but um, I'm interested, I don't know. Yeah, I don't have a lot of response right now. Yeah, check out. This isn't necessarily like a question, but it's just something I wanted to leave maybe like open ended or something that I was wondering if you're thinking about. But your all of your work seems very like monumental. And I kind of see it as being fairly social because I think of time as like a social construct or a human construct, you know, like time is out there but something we created. We attributed these terms and numerals. Um, so your exhibit seems to be kind of this like monument to time to me, or maybe like this monument to this like idea we have of time, or this like lack of idea, so like, along that idea, like what you both kind of think, like your relation of your work together, this time to me seems almost like very like bodily or like fluid, it seems like something, it's like a space that's inhabited when it's, it might not be, so I don't know, what do you think, like in those terms of like monuments and like time as a social construct? And also being very like present in our mind, like conceptually as like a body or something that inhabits like everything or has this like presence. There's a lot there. <laughs> um, so as a monument, I mean I think um, one one thing that happens I think with this exhibition is that it does start you thinking about time and space a little bit differently. Right? Like I think, to kind of go back to the conversation about these two groups of work together, um, there's a sense in which I think, for me at least, and I don't know that Sue would talk about the work exactly like this, but that the sculptures start feeling like they're taking some kind of a measurement of, of space or time, right? Especially because they're related to the body and 
I was thinking that about the work before I had any understanding of the fact that it was based on body measurements of an actual body, right, a physical body. Um, and so you can sort of enter the space and understand that they're starting to relate to the architecture and to bodies. Um, and then you can kind of turn to the work of wall and start thinking about time um, in both very kind of cliched ways, but also hopefully a little bit more um, expanded ways. And so I think that's, the, for me, the space in which they start kind of communicating with each other, the two bodies of work. Um, I don't know if that's any kind of a monument to time, per se. Like, I would think about some of my other works more as monuments, per se. Um, and I don't I think I'm losing track of your other questions. But, no, I just wanted to like, yeah, one of those go. Yeah, Mark. If we could continue with that, go back to your earlier future of how the two of you see your work in conversation with each other in this show. Yeah, that's that's kind of the big one for me. I mean, I, this would be a way oversimplification of I think Sue's work, but um, and they almost feel like devices to me, right, for actually measuring time or measuring space or measuring the body's geographic position in space or in time and space, because the way in which they're kind of inviting, as she described, like interaction, but also resisting it. I think you become aware of your body in time and space in this exhibition. Um, and yeah, I don't know what, like, I think the, I think the drawings almost act as like a support of that more more than they do the other way around. Um, you know, obviously they're not sundials, right? So there's a kind of false uh, equivalency there that I'm kind of forcing on the work. But I think it's a yeah. We have, you know, there's also these larger. I didn't talk about this in my own work, but because this piece doesn't, these pieces don't touch on it exactly. But Sue talked a little bit about. You know, conversations about like faith and belief and kind of these voids or these absences or these kinds of shifts in understanding or shifts in perspective. And a lot of my work it also embodies that conversation. I'm not sure if it's exactly in like, these rubbings and drawings, um, but a lot of it is. And so I think there's a kind of shared set of concerns over analyzing um, faith and belief, um, broadly speaking, um, that is kind of a natural fit, even though the work looks very different. If that makes sense. Yeah. I'm gonna speak to that. Yeah. Um, um, for, um, for me, I just, I mean, um, I think that we are both very interested in um, the interstitial space um, in between, like, those, like, very concrete ideas, um, like, space to just, oh, between, like, one and two. I mean, they're just, I mean he's um, interested in, like, regarding the time, and I think that for me, I'm definitely about the different degrees um, of like, believing in something. I mean, like, so it's not like believing in something or not believing in something, but it's just like there's all this like, ambiguity in that process of searching for the truth and like definite answer. So I think that they kind of, I mean, creating that. I mean, it's kind of almost like creating in between space, basically, um, with the show. I mean, like, that was a idea. Does it make sense? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I feel, yeah. There's probably, I don't know, yeah. Anyways, stop there. <laughs> we can talk more. Anybody else have questions? Yeah. Um, so for the one piece with like like the white like candles and the red bottom, and you said like you pictured like a ghost being by it. Like, did you mean that like when you look at it, like you like picture someone like being on it, or like what did you really like mean by that? Yeah, I mean, so um, by putting those like parts, I mean like that just like definitely like, has a direct reference to the body. I want the viewer to think about like oh like what would it what would it look like I mean if my body's in it. Um, yeah. Yes. So yeah so basically I'm addressing like that like empty space with the work.
So if you still have questions, um, I'm assuming Ryan would certainly be willing to talk to you uh, as we go to the gallery with your refreshments uh, down the hallway and make sure you uh, spend some time to show and talk to them. I'm on 103 students, I have a technical problem, so I will have the sign up sheet uh, on the table. Thanks, everyone.